Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the London School of Economics. My name is Ricky Burdett and uh, together with Philip Rode and a uh, number of many colleagues here uh, run and I'm involved in something called LSE Cities, uh, which is a center which studies cities in an interdisciplinary way and I'll come back to that in a moment. It's a wonderful pleasure for me and many of you here tonight to welcome Ananya Roy to the LSE. She's a fellow traveler and a friend intellectually and in terms of studying this uh, complex thing called the city. Uh, the event tonight is, is um, doubly special because not only do we have Ananya flying in from California to spend a few days with us, but also because we have um, a group of um, students, if I can call them that, uh, mature participants from the Executive Masters in Cities, from many, many different cities around the world, from Africa, from Australia, from the United States, from Latin America and elsewhere, who are part of an intensive uh, learning curve in many ways to bring back the knowledge of this and many other events back to their own cities. So this is live education in a way at its best and represents what the LSE has done, I think, pretty well for about 100 years, to study urban problems uh, and understand their solutions and to try and be as international and as open as possible. Now, Ananya's work is probably familiar to many of you in the room. Uh, it deals with inequality, it deals with displacement, it deals with the fundamental issue of democracy in cities, sometimes not talked about. And it's also a, a rare combination, I think, of attacking theory, developing theory, but also um, understanding from the evidence of the real world what is happening out there. Her work is uh, extremely well known in areas of the global south, particularly in India, Brazil, South Africa, but also increasingly in parts and new work she's going to be doing in the next years in parts of the Mediterranean. But um, what she's talking about tonight, it could be really an issue talked about anywhere in many of the cities that you studied in Anya, uh, but it's the issue of uh, uh, racial displacement. And uh, for that, obviously, looking at the United States and looking in particular at Los Angeles, which has in many ways become her home, is going to be the center of the discussion uh, of her talk tonight. I mean, interesting, the talk is not just about this racial displacement, which she will describe, and also its history, not just its contemporaneity of the issue, but also how this impacts ways of reframing and rethinking what urban theory is about. So the connection between the limits of urban theory and understanding racial displacements are at the heart of what she wants to share with us as effectively new research, ongoing research at the moment, which is fascinating for so many uh, of us who are scholars and also practitioners in uh, urban activity. There are too many books to talk about. Many of you have read them. Um, I think I just want to touch upon one or two themes which um, connect Ananya's work to what we do at LSE Cities. Ultimately, as I mentioned before, we're interested in understanding the physical and the social and how they interact. And Ananya's work for now many years has really dealt with this issue of spatialization of inequality in more precise ways than probably any other scholar I know. So it's very, very uh, welcome for us to be able to have a traveling fellow, as I said before, a partner in understanding these issues of spatialization of inequality when it comes to questions of, of inclusive growth, or so-called inclusive growth, which is talked about by so many national governments at the moment and uh, city governments. But at the heart of that, I think, is something that, that, for me personally, is incredibly significant and often not talked about in our area of the discussion, which is the issue of land. Who actually owns the land that people occupy and then are moved away from, which is so central to tonight's discussion. So displacement, issues of uh, capitalism, issues of neoliberalism gravitate and uh, are surround the question of land. So much so that her phrase, the land in question, that phrase in itself already is a sort of byline, a byword in many ways of how you reframe uh, the discussion about the physical uh, and the social in many of the cities that we study. So we are lucky uh, to have her. It's, um, as you see, Ananya half term, so no one's here at the LSE. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see so many of you tonight. Uh, the way, uh, the format of the evening is the usual LSE event. Ananya will come here, talk, show slides, and talk about her work. Um, that will be around 45 minutes or so. 
We will then have time for questions. We hope to end before 8 p.m. Uh, when we come to questions, please wait for the roving microphones. There will be stewards coming up and down the stairs. Just wait for a microphone to come to you. Um, it would be great if you ask a short question. Um, do tell us who you are. It's always useful to know what your background is, but you keep that short as well. Um, but it would be good to hear your questions. And just do remember, it's sometimes quite difficult uh, to hear you, so speak slowly and um, <clears throat> make sure that we can understand your questions so that Ananya uh, may be able to respond. So that's the structure of the evening. Could you please welcome Ananya Roy to the LSE? Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I would like to thank Ricky for the invitation and generous introduction, and Emily Cruz uh, for making all of the arrangements. It is always a pleasure to be in the company of LSE City colleagues and also to be in London, um, which is always an opportunity to connect with colleagues in many other universities. In the lecture this evening, I want to focus on some of my recent work, which is concerned with what I have come to call racial banishment. In doing so, I will think from and about the United States, but I also hope to present generalizable concepts that situate the study of urban transformations in an analysis of racial capitalism. My intent this evening is to foreground two bodies of thought, post-colonial theory and black geographies, and I want to hold them in simultaneous view. I did some of this in the essay that I wrote for the recently published Sage Handbook of the 21st Century City, edited by Susie Hall and Ricky Bredet. And today, I hope to expand that effort to demonstrate how we might think beyond the limits of urban theory as it is currently constituted. You will notice that all through the talk, what is at stake in this for me, among other things, is an expansion of the repertoire of authoritative texts through which we interpret the urban experience. What counts as theory? What counts as knowledge? And in particular, I want to think about genres of representation that we might not always see as theory with a capital T, be it art or music or the vocabulary of poor people's movements. So with this in mind, given that this is an evening lecture, we're going to start with a bit of hip hop. And I'm hoping that there are some hip hop fans in the audience, yes? So here is the American Hip Hop Collective, a tribe called Quest, yes? Looking at the younger people in the room. And their much acclaimed song, We the People. Released in 2016, the song, We the People, was immediately hailed as a fierce critique of the Trump presidential campaign and presidency. Rolling Stone named it one of the 13 great anti-Trump protest songs. At the 2017 Grammys, a tribe called Quest performed the song with rapper Buster Rhymes, who portrayed Trump as President Agent Orange, and ended with a call to resist. The song, of course, is about the current historical conjuncture of Trumpism and its distinctive constellation of class power, xenophobia, racism, and homophobia. Thus, the refrain of the song, all you black folks, you must go. All you Mexicans, you must go. And all you poor folks, you must go. Muslims and gays, boy, we hate your ways. So all you black, bad folks, you must go. But the song is also a commentary on the persistent practices of urban exclusion and displacement for which the term gentrification has become shorthand. I should note that this line, Gentrify here, now it's not a shithole, has new meaning after Trump's comments about shithole countries. I also read the song as a critique of practices of representation, 
those that turn the hood into a fishbowl and craft narratives that silence and suppress forms of knowledge produced in marginalized urban neighborhoods. So in case you didn't catch the lyrics fully, there's an important set of lines that say, you bastard overlooking street art, better yet, street smarts, but you keep us off the charts. So motherfuck your numbers and your statisticians, fuck you all know about true competition. I want to use the song We the People as a provocation to think not only about gentrification, but also to think beyond the familiar vocabulary that we use in urban studies. Indeed, I want to think beyond familiar narratives of urban displacement, and I want us to think about dispossession, especially racialized dispossession. At the heart of my talk is the following contention that there is a now a large body of work from Neil Smith's theorization of revanchist urbanism to Harvey's emphasis on accumulation by dispossession to Matt Desmond's influential book, Evicted, concerned with urban displacement, gentrification, foreclosures, and evictions. President Obama listed Desmond's book, Evicted, as one of the top reads of 2017. Now, quite a bit of this work interprets the present historical conjuncture as neoliberalization. I build on this work, but I also argue that this body of work ignores three crucial aspects of the political economy of urban displacement. First, evictions, gentrification, foreclosures must be understood as state violence rather than simply an effect of global capitalism. Second, there's a significant racial ethnic dimension to such processes. This in turn requires a conceptual framework that can situate neoliberalism, if we are to call it that, in the long histories of settler colonialism, imperialism, slavery, and racialized expropriation. Put another way, if we are to study the urban frontier, Neil Smith's phrase, then we must pay explicit attention to what Malini Ranganathan has described as the conjoined racial processes of property making and property taking. Third, I argue that we have to shift from the unmarked and disembodied narratives of labor and community to the specific histories of brown and black bodies whose dispossession is tied up with property making and property taking. So this evening, I follow historian Nathan Connolly, who argues that the periodization of neoliberal crisis obscures persistent histories of segregation and abandonment. I quote from his presentation at the Race and Capitalism Conference that I recently convened at UCLA. At that conference, Professor Connolly said, indeed, to live as a Negro under Jim Crow was to live in a so-called neoliberal age before the term became fashionable. What we're experiencing today may simply be the black side of liberalism writ large, the Negroization of the American polity as a whole. Whatever it is, there's nothing neo about it. Thus, urban social movements in the United States are increasingly framing the current historical conjuncture as a moment of racial resegregation. Take, for example, Tony Roshan Samara's analysis of metropolitan transformation in the San Francisco Bay Area. At first glance, what seems to be underway is what has been widely described as the suburbanization of poverty. An increase in poverty between 2000 and 2014 in the suburban jurisdictions of the Bay Area. Far greater increases in poverty than in the urbanized inner regional cities and counties. But Samara, who has been instrumental in creating a regional tenants union and mobilizing rent control campaigns all through the Bay Area, insists that this is in fact simply a new chapter in the long-running story of American segregation. 
So as the second map shows what we are seeing in the Bay Area, but in many other city regions in the United States, is a dramatic shift in where black and Latino communities are growing and located. So in the case of the Bay Area, the Latino population grew overall, but growth was concentrated only at the outer edges of the region. The black population overall declined with a net loss of 22,000 black residents over this period across the region, with most of the losses occurring in long-established communities in the regional core. Put bluntly, what we are seeing in many parts of the United States in the last 10 to 15 years, but speeding up in the last few years, is the banishment of working class communities of color to the far edges of urban life. And we've got to think about the mechanisms that are making this happen. So if in the past, racially restrictive covenants, redlining, and other forms of housing exclusion created residential segregation, then today a key mechanism of resegregation is evictions. Not just foreclosures, pay attention to the ways in which foreclosures have sort of leveled out in cities such as Oakland, one of the key cities in the San Francisco Bay Area, a historically black city, a city that I called home for many, many years. But you can see then the continuing rise in evictions. This is work presented by the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, which is a brilliant data visualization, data analysis, and storytelling collective that describes its work as, I quote, documenting the dispossession of San Francisco Bay Area residents through feminist and decolonial methodologies. What their work shows is the racialized nature of this displacement. So not only this catastrophe of evictions in a city such as Oakland, but the strikingly racialized nature of this. So this data analyzed by the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project lists eviction cases handled by the Eviction Defense Collaborative in San Francisco, and it shows how racial ethnic minorities are being disproportionately hit by this ongoing sweep of evictions. The challenge for urban studies theory in research is that while urban social movements are analyzing such urban transformations as racialized resegregation, I'm not convinced that we have caught up with such analysis. We are still beholden to the familiar vocabularies of gentrification, displacement, revanchism, accumulation by dispossession. And because of that, we are often unable to pinpoint how and why historical difference, by which I mean difference produced and spatialized in the context of colonialisms, is constitutive of urban political economy. How and why historical difference is constitutive of urban political economy. So to make this argument, let me turn once again to another site of urban transformation in the United States, the city that I now call home, the city of angels, Los Angeles. Of the many struggles against gentrification in Los Angeles, Perhaps none grabs as many headlines as Boyle Heights, a Latino working class neighborhood east of downtown Los Angeles. A recent Newsweek article provided the following socioeconomic profile for the neighborhood. That there are 92,000 residents, 94% are Latino, 33% live in poverty, 89% are renters, 95% do not have a four-year college degree. 17% are undocumented migrants. But furnished with a new transit station and suddenly visible as cool and hip, Boyle Heights is ground zero for cultural tourism. Here, for example, is the description of the neighborhood provided by Airbnb. As an I quote, this is difficult to read, as an on-the-border neighborhood, complete with mariachi, moriscos, and murals, and with convenient access to livelier locales like downtown and the arts district. 
But in Boyle Heights, such representations are being vigorously resisted by organizations and movements, um, such as Defend Boyle Heights. From protests against um, art galleries, including this very famous piece of graffiti, Fuck White Art, to um, protests against hipster coffee shops, to boycotts and blockades, activists who've used blunt language and direct action to reveal and challenge the coalitions between developers, city officials, nonprofit organizations, and the art industry that produce what activists in Boyle Heights called art washing or the beautification of violent gentrification. In particular, they have diagnosed such processes as the forced removal of people of color, thus placing contemporary urban transformations in a long history of displacement and dispossession enacted through state violence. This includes the Pico Aliso public housing demolitions and evictions of 1996 that launched in the neighborhood the formation of Union de Vecinos, a very important community-based movement and organization. But it also includes what George Sanchez describes as the tangled history of forced removals in Boyle Heights. This includes the repatriation of Mexican residents in the 1930s, so the rounding up of Mexican Americans during the Great Depression and their repatriation. That repatriation in the case of what is now Boyle Heights was organized by the LA County Board of Supervisors. The internment of Japanese Americans during World War II and large scale urban renewal in the 1950s to build public housing and freeways. What is at stake in Boyle Heights then is what Catherine McKittrick has called herbicide, which she defines as the deliberate death of the city and willful place annihilation. As McKittrick notes, the term herbicide has often been used by urban theorists to indicate geographies of imperialism. But she argues that it must also be extended to geographies of and at home geographies that extend, as she argues, from the plantation to current moments of displacement. Now for me, going back to the song, We the People, what is also at stake in the case of Boyle Heights is the matter of voice, representation, and narrative. Specifically, the state of war in Boyle Heights, which is how activists describe the state of affairs, has generated tremendous controversy in various spheres of knowledge and power, including media and academia. Explicit in their use of frames such as urban colonialism and targeted in their protest tactics, such as the graffiti, fuck white art, Boyle Heights activists have insisted, and I quote, that shit will pop. But this sits quite uncomfortably with the more polite worlds of representation, including those of academic research. So last year, a group of graduate students from my home department at UCLA, Urban Planning, supported by the research institute I direct, the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, formed a year-long working group titled Our Hoods, Our Stories, to learn from and collaborate with the movements and organizations in Boyle Heights. They realized soon, though, that it was not their role to narrate the state of war, and that instead their role was to learn from and try to understand the struggles on the ground in places such as Boyle Heights. At the end of the year, they organized a panel held at UCLA with representatives from community organizations and movements, including Defend Boyle Heights, Union de Vecinos, and so forth. Towards the end of the evening, an adjunct member of the UCLA faculty stood up and commented that each time he or one of his colleagues takes a group of UCLA students to Boyle Heights for a field trip, they face anger and hostility. Why is that, he asked. 
Why can't it be different, he asked. I guess he wanted community members to be nice to us. Implicit in his questions is the fishbowl city. Unmediated and unchecked access to the lives of the subaltern and the spaces of the hood. Needless to say, Boyle Heights residents are not making field trips to the manicured whiteness of Westwood and Bel Air amidst which the UCLA campus sits. We are not the fishbowl. So in the remainder of my time this evening, I want to outline an agenda of research, theory, and representation that takes serious account of the state of war in neighborhoods such as Boyle Heights. As I've already noted, there is considerable research needed to analyze and explain the processes of resegregation underway in city regions in the United States. In my current research, both on the south side of Chicago and in South Los Angeles, I have described some of these practices as forms of racial banishment. And I now want to explain that a bit further. I rely on the conceptualization by Beckett and Herbert of banishment as, quote, legally imposed spatial exclusion. They argue that new urban control tools aim to banish their targets from contested urban spaces for extended periods of time and rest on innovative blends of civil, criminal, and administrative law. These practices, they note, are experienced as punishment, even imprisonment, and also prefigure and enable traditional punishment, such as criminal justice sanction. I'm especially interested in a very specific aspect of racial banishment, which I'm calling the criminalization of innocent behavior. And I'll explain in a minute where I get this phrase from. So last year, the city of Los Angeles passed a new municipal ordinance, LAMC 85.02, which prohibits vehicle dwelling, living in your car. Enforced by the LA Police Department, it prohibits living in a car at all times within one block, 500 feet, of licensed schools, preschools, daycare facilities, or parks. Why those facilities? Why within a block of those things? They have restrooms. God forbid the poor might need to pee. Vehicle dwelling is allowed in limited zones of the city as depicted in the occasional strips of green on these maps. This is one of many, and I'm grateful to Eric Ares at the LA Community Action Network, LA Can, for pointing these maps out to me. So the city has produced these maps that indicate where you might be able to sleep overnight in your car, but even the green on the map is really a lie because most of these green areas are completely bound up in uh, residential parking permits, for example, and have a whole set of parking restrictions. So they d the maps do not convey the full extent of restrictions on vehicle dwelling. Now a crime in Los Angeles, vehicle dwelling is punished by steep fines, which of course the urban poor are unlikely to be able to pay, further deepening their criminalization. This comes at a time where each year Los Angeles has seen a spike in homelessness, including an increase in the homelessness of mothers and children, many of whom rely on sleeping in their car as their only form of shelter. As of a few weeks ago, Los Angeles' homeless count, and you can imagine what, how much of an undercount this is, stood at 60,000 people in a city of 4 million. So I want us to think about this as um, an instantiation of what I'm going to call the homeless ban, which is a cheeky reference to Trump's Muslim ban. So here we have an exercise of sovereign power which, while seemingly arbitrary, is always targeted and hence discriminatory. A couple of years ago, the city of Los Angeles had tried a similar ban, and the court struck down that ordinance. That court ruling stated the following. 
The ordinance is broad enough to cover any driver in Los Angeles who eats food or transports personal belongings in his or her car, yet it appears to be applied only to the homeless. The ban, the judge concluded, criminalizes innocent behavior, which is where I draw that phrase from. Thus, so-called liberal American cities have a plethora of prohibitions that criminalize innocent behavior, the innocent behavior of the poor and poor communities of color. So this is the liberal city of Portland. Such practices constitute a form of banishment, an expulsion from the space and polity of the city. Indeed, what is also at work is something more insidious than this, something that I call the criminalization of vulnerability. I'm drawing here on the research of one of my graduate students, Sochi Ortiz, who shows that a common cause for tenant evictions, think back to that map of Oakland, think about those red dots on the map, think about the ongoing increases in evictions, we know now that across the United States, a common cause for tenant evictions um, disproportionately of women of color is what are called nuisance ordinances. These are city level laws that penalize landlords whose rental properties have become a nuisance. A property can be designated as a nuisance by the city for a variety of reasons. So imagine the piling up of garbage. But one of the reasons for designating a property as a nuisance is if from that property, there have been one too many 911 calls, emergency calls to fire and ambulance services, right? Presumably made in the context of life and death situations. So in fact, landlords Fearing a nuisance designation are found to preemptively evict tenants who have been making one too many 911 calls. Okay? So the nuisance ordinances serve as the pretext or the reason for these preemptive evictions. <laughs> the catch is that in many of these rental properties, these calls are being made by women who face domestic violence, and domestic abuse. So Ortiz, in the paper that she wrote for me, thus makes note of a case fought by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. So this was a case that played out in 2012 in Norristown, Pennsylvania. A victim of domestic violence, Ms. Lakeisha Briggs, called the police to her apartment 10 times between January and May of 2012. She then received a letter from her landlord saying that she would be evicted if she continued to place these calls due to the city's chronic nuisance ordinance. Fearing an eviction, Ms. Briggs stopped calling the police, but her abuser did not stop stalking her and abusing her. In May 2012, she was brutally attacked, stabbed, and nearly died. She did not call the police. Her neighbors did. While in the hospital for her injuries, her landlord and the city began eviction procedures against her for that last 911 call, that additional call that was made not from her unit, but from her neighbor's unit pertaining to her. This is state violence in its crudest form. And what is key to such uses of the law is that they are simultaneously arbitrary and targeted. And they are, of course, forms of dispossession, not only of home, but indeed of personhood itself. So I want to think a bit more about dispossession and what this means for our conceptual frameworks. In ongoing debates, urban studies scholars such as Oren Yevtekel have called for attention to old and new urban colonialities that produce, as Yevtekel argues, a permanent state of displaceability for certain social groups. In doing so, they have insisted, as have social movements in neighborhoods such as Boyle Heights, 
that contemporary displacement has to be understood in relation to histories of settler colonialism, slavery, and imperialism. As Matt Hearn puts it in his recent book, What a City is For, under all is the land. And this in turn requires an account of the colonial accumulation our cities are constructed on and the kinds of labor that built them. In recent work, I have argued that what this approach implies is a reckoning with the foundational category of property. I built here on the work of Nick Blomley, who argues that instead of asking what is property, we must ask what is to count as property. I extend Blomley's work by asking an additional question. Who can count as the subject? Who can claim home and land? If certain subjects are always necessarily dispossessed or even constituted as property owned by others or constituted as property supervised by the state, how then do they claim property? As Alyosha Goldstein argues in his analysis of the proprietary regimes of settler colonialism, possession must be understood not as preceding dispossession, but rather as its effect. I want to repeat that. Possession must be understood not as preceding dispossession, but rather as its effect. It is through dispossession that the capacity to possess is produced. And differential racialization, Goldstein argues, is necessary for this colonial and post-colonial capacity to possess. So I was reminded of this recently by a beautiful song by American rapper J. Cole. Any J. Cole fans in the audience? A few. All right. So this is a song called Neighbors. What's interesting about the music being made by J. Cole, by Common, by many other American rappers, is the foregrounding of these forms of banishment, carcerality, criminalization. At his concerts, J. Cole foregrounds themes of incarceration. He wears um, a prison uniform for the entire concert, usually. He is led out, often in handcuffs, and he um, performs in that prison uniform on a stage that mimics a prison. In doing so, he draws attention to what Michelle Alexander has so famously called the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration as a new form of racial segregation in the United States. Neighbors is a song about possession. It is a song about integration and the suburban dream, quite familiar to us as urbanists. In the song, J. Cole talks about buying a beautiful new home on the lake, the dream of integration, the dream of leaving the inner city. But he is, in fact, soon subject to a militarized police raid because the neighbors think he's selling dope. That is, in fact, the refrain of the song. The neighbors think, I'm selling dope. He is, as the song goes, black in white man's territory. He is black in white man's territory. So here's a glimpse of that raid from J. Cole's concert in Los Angeles last year. This is real video. Look. You got to see how the bus over the This big one for you. There you go. Boom. Boom. Ain't even not. Don't do shit. Now what I see from Cap these things. Cap on. What the fuck is this nigga doing? Now you know we have cameras. Look at this dumb motherfucker. He think he's busting into a fucking drug room right now. He think this is a room. Fucking whole thing. This is the outside of the fucking idiot. Look at this dirty motherfucker, that's my post-it, first of all. He probably sees black people got cameras, look what he do. 
song ends with the words, don't know what I was thinking, I'm moving back to the south side, so much for integration. I'm really interested then in this um, making of black in a white man's territory and how that requires for us not only to think about blackness, but also to think, of course, about whiteness. So I'm interested in the mutual constitution of whiteness and blackness and the central role of the law in such forms of racial entitlement and racial banishment. Especially useful here is Oren Yefthekel's argument about what he calls gray spaces, those positioned between the whiteness of legality, approval, safety, and the blackness of eviction, destruction, death. Yefthekel notes that these spaces are tolerated and managed, but while being encaged within discourses of contamination, criminality, and public danger, to the desired order of things. In contrast, gray spaces created by powerful or favorable interests, Yeftekel argues, are laundered. Similarly, in my conceptualization of urban informality, I have argued that the planning functions of the state valorize and even produce urban forms of elite illegality and criminalize subaltern informality. An obvious but striking example of such state violence comes from the West Bank. So this is Area C. It's a jurisdiction encompassing 61% of the West Bank and created by the 1995 Oslo II Accords. Israel has full control of civil and security affairs including urban planning, construction, infrastructure, and urban development in Area C. What you see in this particular photograph um, in the foreground here is an, what is known as an unrecognized Bedouin village. Displaced from the Negev Desert, where Oren Yefzakal, in fact, does much of his research, these Bedouins face the constant threat of eviction and removal. They live in what Yevtokol would call a permanent state of displaceability. But what is interesting is on the horizon is the sprawling Jewish settlement of Malay Adumin, illegal by international law, but laundered, if you will, by Israeli occupation and settler colonialism. While the illegal Jewish settlement enjoys urban amenities and is connected to Jerusalem through premium infrastructure, the unrecognized village of Abu Nawar faces eviction, with the Israeli government threatening to relocate the villagers to a nearby toxic garbage dump to make way for the planned expansion of Malay Adumin. At the kindergarten, Self-built and self-run by the Bedouins, children draw their urban hopes and aspirations, and I was very struck by this. They draw homes that resemble those that they see every day on the horizon, the suburban homes of Malay Adumim, a settlement that they can never enter. Right? To think from Boyle Heights or from Abu Nawar is to theorize from the South. The South is not a location, it is a relation. It is a structural relation of space, power, and knowledge produced and maintained in the crucible of racial capitalism on a global scale. To see from the South is to see Euro-America differently. It is to see racialized expropriation and racialized subjection as constitutive of liberal democracy. It is to see what Gilroy pinpoints as the racial terror that he notes lies at the heart of European modernity. All through this lecture, I have been showing you the art of Kerry James Marshall, whose paintings of black life for me are mind-blowing. When the Kerry James Marshall retrospective happened last year at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, I lost count of my visits to that exhibition. 
Born in Birmingham, Alabama, Marshall grew up in South Los Angeles. His iconic painting, this one, is inspired by Ralph Ellison's iconic text, Invisible Man. But in making blackness visible, which Marshall sees to be the puzzle he's tackling, Marshall also makes whiteness visible. And this is key to the theory, research, and representation I'm asking us to consider. So you've been looking at Marshall's paintings, and I hope you will take the time later to take a closer look at his work. But I wanted to share one in particular with you in some detail. This is his triptych, heirlooms and accessories, usually displayed in museums in this way, right? So you sort of make your way to the triptych, you walk through the exhibition space, and as you get closer, you see that these are three images of um, smiling white women, their faces framed in lockets, heirlooms and accessories. But what is devastating about this triptych is that the faces are drawn from a 1930 lynching in Marion, Indiana. Marshall's art is a guide for analyzing what theorists such as George Lipset have described as the possessive investment in whiteness, the title of Lipset's most famous book. Lipset traces the ways in which such investment is produced and nurtured to various forms of policy, particularly urban planning, such as the construction of white unity to systems of residential segregation. Now, what is at stake in such attention to racial capitalism, I am arguing, is a challenge to the Eurocentrism of urban theory. As many of you know, in my previous work, I have argued that we must world urban theory differently, and we must think about the making of global capitalism, not only in so-called global cities, but in relation to many places on the map. That argument was and remains beholden to Jenny Robinson, and it is she who, in fact, I think has pushed urban studies to consider its Eurocentric theorizations and methodologies. But what I'm also interested in now is how the challenge to Eurocentrism must not only reveal the ontological multiplicity of global urbanisms, which is what Iwa Ong and I were trying to do in this book, how it must refuse the universal grammar that urban theory seeks to impose on our work. But I'm also interested in how we might enact a rethinking of the West itself. For me, post-colonial theory, then, is not so much a way of interpreting and narrating the post-colony out there somewhere else, as it is a method for interpreting and narrating the West. Or rather, as Derek Gregory has put it, inspired by Edward Said, the stories the West most often tells itself about itself. Or the stories, in fact, the West refuses to tell itself about itself. I'm arguing that racial capitalism might be one of those untold stories in urban studies. So let me give you a glimpse of what might be at stake in telling the story of racial capitalism. In a 2014 essay titled Behind Marx's Hidden Abode, published in New Left Review, feminist philosopher Nancy Fraser calls for an expanded conception of capitalism arguing that we have to understand capitalism as an institutionalized social order rather than simply an economy, Fraser foregrounds what she calls the hidden abodes of capitalism, such as patriarchy, that make possible a capitalist society and its reproduction. In an important critique, Michael Dawson notes that what Fraser misses, in his words, is the abode of race hidden in plain sight. And because she does so, she also misses, he argues, 
an explicit consideration of expropriation as an indispensable logic of capitalism. Most recently, first in um, the Repke Lecture in Economic Geography at last year's AAG, and now in a published essay, Frazier has responded to Dawson agreeing that exploitation-centered conceptions of capitalism, I'm quoting here from her piece, cannot explain its persistent entanglement with racial oppression. She calls in this new piece for attention to expropriated rather than exploited labor, labor that is unfree and subject to domination unmediated by the wage contract. Such expropriation, she notes, is accompanied by racialized subjection, or as she puts it, the constitution of others as lesser beings, from chattel slaves to debt peons. The exchange between Fraser and Dawson is one glimpse of how the study of racial capitalism can remake our co-concept of exploitation, dispossession, and much more. And the South then comes to have a different meaning. Theory from the South, as I've argued many times, is not about the Southern Hemisphere or the cities of the Global South. It is about a new relationality of theory. We are reminded of this in the growing body of work known as Black Geographies and its attention to the American South, which is also not just in the southern half of the United States. So this, for example, is from the recent book, um, Chocolate Cities, by Marcus Hunter and Zandria Robinson, where they call for a new map of black life, one that sees the geography of the black American experience as existing within and across varying versions of the South. For them, the South is one large territory governed by a historically rooted and politically inscribed set of practices of racial domination. But they also see the South as a frame, as cultural forms that travel across the United States. The South, then, is epistemology and experience. It is territory and history. It is plantation, prison, colony, but it is also migration, movement, and freedom. Again, what is at stake is what Kate Derrickson has called out recently as the unbearable whiteness of the discipline of geography itself. In doing so, Derrickson echoes scholars such as Laura Pulido, who have not only mapped white privilege, but also demonstrated the constitutive whiteness of the discipline of geography. Urban studies and planning, my field of inquiry, does not enjoy immunity from such critique. Indeed, these spatially oriented disciplines often demonstrate an amnesia about their role in producing and legitimizing racialized landscapes of expulsion and exclusion. They're also steeped in what Ranganathan has called a racial liberalism, an unshakable faith in integration despite these persistent histories of segregation and abandonment. But I want to close today's lecture on a slightly different note. I want to sh close by sharing with you a look at how a commitment to post-colonial theory and black geographies has shaped the work of a new institute I have the great privilege of directing at UCLA, the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, which turned two this month. From the start, we have drawn inspiration from poor people's movements fighting for racial justice in cities around the world. And we have seen our efforts to produce theory and research as an effort to dismantle what W.E.B. Du Bois called the color line. With the election of Trump, we have deepened our commitment to name and challenge white supremacy and white power. And we have sought to learn from the long-standing project of abolition democracy in the United States. <clears throat> 
Indeed, our graduate students in urban planning have sought to boldly rethink the pedagogy and canon of the discipline itself via abolitionist praxis, creating a brand new curriculum around abolitionist planning. But what does abolitionism mean in the context of racial banishment and resegregation as I outlined it today? For us, it means taking on the spatialized logics of criminalization and in particular tackling the systems and structure of mass incarceration. It means analyzing and exposing racial banishment. So here, for example, is a project led by my UCLA colleagues, notably Professor Kelly Lytle Hernandez in history, who also directs the Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA. Titled Million Dollar Hoods, this project maps the spatiality of criminalization in the city of Los Angeles, which if you didn't know it, operates the largest jail system on earth at a price tag of $1 billion a year. Professor Hernandez's new book on Los Angeles is therefore appropriately titled City of Inmates. What is striking about their work, they were able to, for example, to get data from the LA Sheriff's Department and LA Police Department that other researchers have not been able to get, is that they are able to show how, from, 20, from starting in 2010, we, they are able to map what they call the costs of incarceration, the actual investment by the city of Los Angeles in criminalizing and incarcerating people. Not surprisingly, much of this investment goes into a handful of neighborhoods, precisely in those neighborhoods that have long histories of disinvestment in public infrastructure, the neighborhoods that have a long history of disinvestment in parks and schools and housing. And what you see, for example, as in the case of Lancaster, are the millions of dollars spent in criminalizing and incarcerating people at precisely the time when the school has a massive crisis of public schools, housing, and much more. And in fact, what we see with projects like Million Dollar Hoods is in fact the ramping up of policing of the most vulnerable and how expensive that policing is. So the city of Los Angeles has declared a state of emergency around homelessness. Our mayor keeps telling us that there isn't enough money to build supportive housing or affordable housing. Where is that money going to come from? And yet millions of dollars are being spent each year, not only in places like Lancaster, criminalizing and incarcerating young men of color, primarily brown and black bodies, but also, as a recent report by Million Dollar Hood shows, policing the houseless, policing those living on Skid Row, often sleeping on the streets. And it is not just in these expected sites of carcerality that we see this sort of state violence. We see it also throughout a set of institutions that we might have thought were somehow protected from state violence. One example of this um, are public schools, the LA Unified School District. So these are perhaps somewhat familiar images, not only from Los Angeles, but from around the world. Right? The policing of the homeless, of the figure of the squatter, of the informal vendor, the confiscation of personal belongings, the fines, but what is interesting about cities like Los Angeles is the, the, the presence of state violence in institutions such as the school. So at the institute I direct, we have an activist in residence program. This year's activist in residence is Manuel Criolo, who has about 20 years of experience organizing in Los Angeles, including as a part of the legendary Bus Riders Union. Criola's current work is on ending the school-to-prison pipeline, and in particular, drawing a historical timeline of the emergence 
of the Los Angeles School Police Department within the LA Unified School District. This is not just any old police force. This is a highly militarized police force that every year spends millions of dollars ticketing, fining, and criminalizing usually young male students, brown and black, thereby creating what is known as the school to prison pipeline. Criola reminds us of one recent VIN as a part of the Labor Community Strategy Center that he's been very involved in. So about a year and a half ago, the Labor Community Strategy Center was able to put enough pressure through organizing to have the LA School Police Department return military grade weaponry that the school police department had acquired from the Department of Defense. And when I say military grade weaponry, I'm not joking. It included 61 M16 rifles, three grenade launchers, and a mine resistant ambush protected tank. So that work continues. But the work of the Institute also seeks to hold up the struggle for what my friend and comrade at UCLA, Robin D.G. Kelly, one of the most important interlocutors in black studies, calls freedom dreams. And the concept of freedom dreams is especially important for us in urban studies as a conceptual and methodological challenge. To think about freedom dreams means taking up the challenge presented by thinkers such as Clyde Woods and Catherine McKittrick, who argue, and I'm quoting here from McKittrick's work, that black suffering and naming racism should not be the sole conceptual schemas through which to understand or know blackness or race. It also means taking up the challenge presented by post-colonial theorists such as Walter Mignolo, who ask us to imagine and make real decolonial freedom. One important freedom dream guiding our work is that of abolition and black reconstruction. And I'm asking us as urban studies scholars to think not only about these as histories, but in fact as living concepts that have the radical potentiality to reformulate the work we do. As the history of dispossession is a long one in the United States, so is the dream of abolition democracy, the unfinished work of black reconstruction. In his magisterial book published in 1935, W.E.B. Du Bois reminds us that the end of slavery brought with it the promise of the redistribution of land. Of a Freedmen's Bureau that would distribute 40 acres and a mule to each of the 4 million freed slaves. Abolitionists asked, can emancipation be carried out without using the land of the slave masters? But such land confiscation and redistribution never took place in the United States. Instead, southern slave owners were compensated for their loss of property, i.e. freed slaves, and freed slaves were soon subject to a new regime of racial terror, which hardened into Jim Crow segregation. But dreams of abolition lingered. And in 1935, Du Bois was to write in this book, it is quite possible that long before the end of the 20th century, the deliberate distribution of property and income by the state on an equitable and logical basis will be looked upon as the state's prime function. These freedom dreams are being revived and recrafted by the social movement of our time, notably by Black Lives Matter. In particular, the movement for black lives articulates an ethics of redistribution and reparations that counters social death. And what matters to me is that these demands put forward by the movement for black lives is centered on the state. That on the one hand, it challenges state violence and exposes black death. But on the other hand, it insists on a politics of redistribution centered on the state. Indeed, in Freedom Dreams, Robin Kelly writes that we have to think about the state. We have to demand from the state. 
He writes that federal assistance in the United States to black people is not a gift. It is a down payment for centuries of unpaid labor, violence, and exploitation. And here it is worth returning to Du Bois and black reconstruction. The subtitle of that remarkable text is this, an essay toward a history of the part which black folk played in the attempt to reconstruct democracy in America, 1860 to 1880. The book is, as Cedric Robinson puts it in Black Marxism, a theory of history in keeping with subaltern studies and other forms of post-colonial thought. As a vision of democracy, black reconstruction during those two decades, 1860 to 1880, involved the creation of public infrastructures. For example, as Du Bois notes, freed slaves were consumed with a desire for schools. It is their organized effort for education that created the free common school in the southern United States, something that I didn't know until I first read Du Bois's book. It had created a form of public education in a part of the world that had only known private schools. Imaginations of justice then abound, from the right to the city to dreams of urban revolution, our scholarly traditions often reveal these normative horizons, be it those of post-capitalism or something else. What I'm most interested in is why some communities are able to make, as Gibson Graham put it, how they're able to make revolution from crisis. Why some, not all? And how do we honor such exuberance? what Catherine McKittrick has called a black sense of place, an understanding of black geographies that is not limited to black suffering and black death. So let me leave you then with this puzzle that I continue to grapple with as I think with post-colonial theory and black geographies. My work on racial banishment is, as the name suggests, about banishment. It is about social death. It is about state violence. It takes as its starting proposition, Ruthie Gilmore's important argument about racism. Racism, she notes, is the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. But the challenge for urban studies, for geography, for urban planning, and other related disciplines is not simply to document and analyze racial banishment or even to take account of the long history of racial terror. It is to do so while keeping in mind the decisive declaration by the late Clyde Woods. I quote, predictions of the death of impoverished and actively marginalized racial and ethnic communities are premature. He therefore boldly asks, have the tools of theory, method, instruction, and social responsibility become so rusted that they can only be used for autopsies? I hope not. At the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, we boldly declare that this is not the case. And with humility and accountability, we strive to learn from places such as Boyle Heights and Abu Nawar, and to participate in building power and dismantling the color lines of the 21st century. Thank you. Ananya, thank you for such a powerful talk. And I'm sure that we want to use um, some of this time to follow up on the multi-headed um, areas of critique and insights that you offered on uh, Los Angeles. Uh, there was one thing I just wanted to start uh, simply because you provoked in my, 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 many uh, emotions, actually, many thoughts. But um, you remember the book by Mike Davis, City of Courts, yes. that will be familiar to many of you here. And there was a photograph in it which still I use often and haunts me in many ways, which I thought was of a world disappeared, which was a picture of a bench, actually quite well made, 
-hmm. in downtown LA, this is probably 40 years ago, yes. uh, designed and com uh, for and commissioned by the Los Angeles Police Department. And it was designed quite well with a slightly curved surface so that anyone who fell asleep on it would fall. And if you fell, you could then be picked up, arrested, moved on, and all that. And I think what you've been talking about today is how this is part, this small, tiny episode of uh, a, a physical artifact which embeds uh, a, a sort of mentality which goes well beyond. You've brought to us in, in, in an extraordinary way. And I just wanted to ask you one or two questions about that. I mean, your maps of where you can't sleep in a car are the equivalent of that. Yes. But writ large at uh, uh, many levels. Your notion of state violence is something which I think we begin to understand in different ways. And you came back at the end with the historical perspective. It's been there a long time. Yeah. Can you say just a little bit more about that? What has been happening in the last 30, 40 years that even our disciplines were just silent? Is what you, that was your indictment at the end. I mean, where, where are the planning historians? Who's been talking about it? So it, not only at UCLA, or, uh, UCLA, but elsewhere. And what are the policy makers thinking and doing in reaction to this voice that you've opened up? So if we could start from that, and then um, we can come around with microphones and ask others. But I'd just be curious on your thoughts there. Yes, thank you, Ricky. So um, indeed, Mike Davis's City of Court was, was an incisive look at the transformations taking place in downtown Los Angeles, which now is sort of thoroughly um, transformed, if you will, except the Skid Row. And what Davis focused on was the Bunker Hill development, which in many ways was the first sort of serious uh, public-private project that um, marked the return of the elite uh, to downtown LA. And I think his phrase for those um, benches that were meant to deter the homeless was geographies of micro-fortification. And those geographies of micro-fortification, of course, have been present for a while. There's been quite a bit of controversy um, in various cities here in the UK around similar design endeavors, right? Um, the benches that, that sort of have handles in the middle so that no one can really lie on that bench. Um, the barrel-shaped benches, the sprinklers that go off in the parks at night, and so forth. Um, but I think what we're seeing, and what we've seen in Los Angeles in particular, is a scaling up of those practices of microfortification to what many of my colleagues would say is a militarized campaign um, of banishment. Mm -hmm. And it's in everything from the school district um, to uh, places like Skid Row, where the homeless are concentrated, but which now lies in the heart of um, quite expensive real estate development, to um, the various forms of carcerality that we are seeing in marginalized neighborhoods. So I think an important part of that, and one of the biggest silences that I think um, that I'm trying to point out, is that. If we are to talk about urgent issues in theory, research, and practice in our field, well, mass incarceration in the United States is at the very top of that list. It is a planning issue. It is one of the key ways in which racial segregation and spatialized segregation has been continued. And it's not just about the prison industrial complex. It is the ways in which urban life itself has been restructured through these practices of carcerality that are undeniably racialized, but that also make possible what Lipsitz calls this possessive investment in whiteness. So we've got to understand not only racial banishment, but also what I like to think of as racial entitlement. And that, um, for me, remains an important agenda of research. Now, of course, one can say that this is a uniquely American story. I think not. So the work we've been doing in, uh, in, uh, at UCLA um, around race and capitalism is thinking globally about these questions. And in our most recent conference, we brought together scholars who think about racial capitalism across the Americas. Keisha Khan Perry, thinking about black women's resistance to land grabs in Brazil. 
um, thinking about imperialism in the Philippines and Puerto Rico as the bordering of America, thinking about the land question in relation to settler colonialism, not only in the United States, but in Israel, Palestine, and many other parts of the world. So I think the thinking globally about this might not uh, lead us to a focus on mass incarceration, but might lead us to those questions of expropriation and racialized subjection that have come up in the ongoing debate between Nancy Fraser and Michael Dawson. Right. We'll come, maybe come back to that later, but a couple of questions. Can we see your hands up? So there's a lady at the back. Tell us who you are, please. If you stand up, if you don't mind, it's easier to Fair. make contact. Uh, my name is Laura Bletcher. Thanks very much. That was really interesting. Um, if I've understood correctly, it seems like the uh, one of the root causes of the phenomena you're describing is kind of the legalization of discrimination, which is pretty much contrary to human rights law. So I'm wondering to what extent international human rights law, for example, is being used to challenge what's going on, and even if that's an appropriate tool. Thank you for that question. Um, I've recently been in conversation with a wonderful border studies scholar, Nicholas de Genova. And um, I, I followed de Genova's work very closely because he compels us to think about what he calls the legal production of migrant illegality, right? And insists that, say, as ethnographers or historians, what we have to study is not just the illegal body and its struggles, but these mechanisms of illegalization and the ways it is precisely, as you note, a legal production. Not only entailing state violence, but often the law as it is constituted which goes back to my argument about how we need to rethink dispossession and the capacity to possess. Many of the movements that I work with and study have in fact turned to international human rights law. So um, the Chicago anti-eviction campaign that works on the south side of Chicago, fighting evictions, occupying homes, now creating a community land trust. They were directly inspired by and really catalyzed by the Western Cape anti-eviction campaign, um, which uh, was in existence in Cape Town, South Africa. And together, they have thought quite a bit about framing this as a human rights disaster. And repeatedly, these movements, whether in LA or Chicago, have turned to the UN Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing. Um, one of our dear colleagues, Raquel Rolnick, was in that position. And she, in fact, issued a scathing report of racial discrimination in housing in the United States. But a few months later, President Obama got elected, our first black president, and it was all over. We went post-racial bliss, or, or so we thought, right? Um, most recently, uh, the current Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing, Leilani uh, Farha, was in Los Angeles, again a scathing indictment of the homelessness crisis, framing it in terms of colonialism and segregation. Um, but other than a moral indictment, right, there isn't necessarily um, a set of mechanisms there to make those frameworks real on the ground. And so movements, in fact, are quite aware of that um, and recognize that human rights discourse or even law is not necessarily going to save them. Other questions? Oh, just right in front of you, over there. Thank you. Any Thank other you hands? Can I see? Thank you very much, um, Khadija Ghulam Hussain. Um, so your lecture focuses on um, blacks and Latinos in the US. I was just wondering if you've done any research on other non-white groups in the US and if their experience is different as, and if it's different as a result of different histories um, and the, the interplay with um, religious affiliations. Thank you. So in, in the case of, of, of Los Angeles um, and the United States more broadly, sort of the conceptual but also um, activist work we've been doing sort of is at the intersection of um, indigenous sovereignty, border studies, and black geographies. 
And this is not my work. Um, this is work that builds on and learns from the work of my colleagues at UCLA, um, particularly the African American Studies Department and Center, American Indian Studies, and Chicano Chicano Studies. And in particular, I want to call out the work um, of one of my newest colleagues at UCLA, Kyle Mays, who has an appointment in American Indian Studies and African American Studies, and his forthcoming book is on indigenous hip hop. But for urban studies scholars in the room, his uh, authored book, which is also coming out quite soon, is on Detroit, and it looks at black belonging and indigenous sovereignty. So in particular, if we are to think about the present histories of settler colonialisms, we've got to think about um, the multiplicity and iterability of dispossession. So a place like Boyle Heights can be understood through the displacement of black and Latino populations, including as well as Japanese American populations, but also um, sort of the founding act of dispossession of indigenous populations, right? Now, in, in sort of a related but somewhat separate project, I've been thinking a lot about um, the city in the age of Trumpism, and particularly efforts to build sanctuary cities in the face of what is resurgent right-wing nationalism in many parts of the world. And in doing that work, of course, I've been thinking across the Atlantic and thinking about uh, philosophies and practices of hospitality and sanctuary here um, in Europe, particularly via Derrida and Levinas. And in thinking about Europe, I think um, it's really important then to think about Islamophobia. And yet another site of right-wing nationalism that I am compelled to think about, India. Similarly, one has to think about Islamophobia as a key aspect of these logics of segregation and banishment. It's not my research, but I think it's absolutely crucial and I will say here then that um, returning to the research and theory of, De of Nicolas de Geneva, his latest book is on the borders of Europe. And he insists that whether it be in the case of the United States or Europe, we've got to hold in simultaneous view Islamophobia, the legal production of migrant illegality, these various border crossings, um, his poignant phrase is these border crossings that have turned the Mediterranean into a mass grave. And we've got to think then about how various forms of criminalization come together. So in the US context, it's impossible to think about the legal production of migrant illegality since the 1990s without also thinking about how all of this gets heightened and really sharpened and intensified after 9-11 and after the formation of a new infrastructure of surveillance and criminalization. Some of this work you will be doing as you look at Greece and other Mediterranean countries? No, that's, no. A, slightly, that's a slightly different project on housing justice. Okay, let's get yes. another last question. Hello, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Adam, a postgraduate student here. I just had a question. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your, or kind of implied earlier in your presentation, about uh, the role of the university and how they can kind of perpetuate the fishbowl uh, paradigm, I guess. I was wondering, yeah, what is the responsibility of the university in gentrification, especially uh, urban universities like UCLA, USC also in California, uh, think of University of Chicago in Chicago, and maybe Columbia in New York. Um, and so what is their responsibility in perpetuating gentrification and what's their uh, role you know, vis-a-vis -vis their immediate communities and really embedding themselves in the community rather than being sometimes a force against the community. Well, so you're a new arrival to UCLA, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Thank you for that question because it's absolutely central to, um, to this work. So indeed, um, powerful, wealthy urban universities have been, for lack of a better term, gentrifiers. There are other terms we can use. Communities use other terms. They call us colonizers, right? And I think the extractive nature of that relationship is one that we have to keep in mind, which is the extractive nature of that fishbowl research, but it is also much more. Right? And needless to say, the university is not only complicit in, but is part, actually structurally, a part of racial capitalism. So I'm very proud to belong to mm -hmm. 
a public university. Um, I spent much of my previous academic life at UC Berkeley, also a great public university. But our universities, the bodies at the university, the students and especially the faculty do not look like the state of California, despite our tremendous records of success in recruiting and graduating first generation students and students of color. So that distance, that seemingly unbridgeable distance between the powerful elite global university and the communities we seek to study, make a difference in, has to be addressed. So some of the ways in which we have been trying to do this or thinking about it at UCLA is what I call um, turning the university inside out. So we've explicitly framed the institute I direct as one that is intent on decolonizing the university which for us means taking our research to the communities we're supposedly studying with a sense of being accountable to them. Right? Um, of thinking about the ways in which our research builds power and is in solidarity with these movements, but also bringing to the university and creating a space, be it through an activist and residence program, but many other ways, um, a space for those whose voices have not always been um, given importance at the university to be able to, sh to utilize the resources of the university. And this latter idea comes from an inspiring book which I was rereading today, um, a book co-authored by Fred Moten, who's at UC Riverside. And it's a book on the undercommons. And we've taken very seriously the idea of the undercommons. So Moton dismisses the figure of the critical intellectual, saying all we do as the critical intellectual is simply extend all of this. We sort of legitimize the university. He calls for the role of the subversive individual, and he draws on black fugitive studies to think about what subversion might be, what marooned communities might be at the university, those whose bodies and voices and experiences are not legitimized in the university, but he also says very famously, and this has inspired a lot of our graduate students at UCLA, is that we've got to have a criminal relationship with the university. The subversive individual steals the resources of the university and redeploys it for the purpose of building a new world, which he calls the undercommons. Right? So we've been thinking a lot about what that work of undercommoning might be and how, in fact, as a research institute, we might be shaped by that ethos and methodology rather than by well-established forms of extraction and representation. I know there are many people who want to ask you things, but we've got a, maybe a little bit of time after this for you to uh, have a chat. But I think because it's after 8 and we promised we would end the evening, we do have to stop here. I think everyone in the room knows that we could have continued on at least 10 of your themes in great depth. I mean, for me, the, 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 the fact that you're connecting your research to new formulations of theory, using new forms of representation to re-understand the world out there is absolutely extraordinary, important, and I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here uh, for your really touching, troubling, informative, and eloquent talk. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.